Sunday. But I'm just talking short stuff. Uh, it's a bust of Abraham Lincoln by Robert Russin. 12 by 2 feet high and resting on a 30 foot tall granite pedestal. Here's the Lincoln Monument. In Wyoming, at least. Commemorates the Lincoln Highway, America's first transcontinental automobile road. And Henry Bourne Joy, the first president of the Lincoln Highway Association. Home of the military for nearly 100 years, between 1879 and 1964, the administration of the Pole Mountain Division was shares between the War Department and the Forest Service. The region was first set aside as a forest reserve to procure wood for several forts. It was used as a target and maneuver area for Fort D.A. Russell. In 1925, the region was completely turned over to the War Department and used for military exercises until 1961. Today, it is a popular recreation area in the Medicine Bow National Forest. tons of clay were used to create the mold. The sculpture alone weighs 4,500 pounds. The head was cast in 30 pieces and bolted together. The base is hollow with a concrete pillar, ladders, and lightning rods. Albeit from behind glass, but still pretty neat. His old somber Abe. If only Abe, if only Abe was a better judge of character when it came to the Ames brothers, right? Stay tuned for the upcoming Return to the Pyramid episode for more context. This is kind of neat. There's the uh, sculptor himself. There's how they placed it. Back in the 1959, I believe. Yeah. It's quite a uh, stark feature. I read it was supposed to demonstrate That's a Lincoln quote right there. And he's only 66 when he got assassinated, I guess. What a noisy place for a monument. Holy moly. <clears throat> I guess it's appropriate. Appropriate honoring the Lincoln Highway because that's all you can hear around here is traffic. The, uh, <laughs> the people are putting pennies in there. Pennies. Uh, dimes, pennies, yeah. That there should be a Lincoln Highway across this country is the important thing. Interesting, like Egyptian looking hieroglyphics there. Yeah. Must have been Masonic inspired, maybe. That's that. 
Andy, there it is. That's everybody throwing their pennies. There's Lincoln, I'm gonna get a penny. It's on. It's kind of weird how it's like this. It looks like it's got these four corners. It's obvious in the center. A little spiky fence around it. This looks like an altar. Kind of Da Vinci Code stuff going on here. The blue arrows, and the L symbols. This one's going up too. Is he going up? It's really weird. And that one's a little turn signal again. These masons in there. Weird little code code symbols. Yeah. Yeah. The Lincoln Highway. It's a marker for the Lincoln Highway. Okay. So we showed because because we went to that Lincoln Monument and had those all the way around. Yeah. The, uh, well, you see, did you see the picture up here? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. It's laughable. Look at the top one. Yep. Nebraska that way, Wyoming that way, <laughs> oh. that way, San Francisco that way. <laughs> now that's directions. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's what this was supposed to be then? You know, uh, you're directing them, right. Yeah. Wow. Okay, there's for the Lincoln Highway, there's that way, wow. that way. It's not confusing at all. Yeah. And if you wanted to know anything about it, you know, there's a, a real elderly gentleman that works at the visitor center. He's not there today and it's probably closed by now. Mm -hmm. He's way in his 90s, mm -hmm. and he belonged to Lincoln Highway oh, Society wow. or whatever it mm -hmm. is, and he could tell you anything about the Lincoln Highway. Okay, that's interesting. So again, we got these like rough cut stones. You can see the uh, drill marks. There's the sad looking Lincoln. Really bad angle right here. Yeah. It's like he's encased in. Poor guy. It's like he's trapped in this rock sarcophagus kind of emblematic of America today huh yep there's the purple heart trail monument I heard about that too George Washington stated on August 7 1782 let it be known that he who wears the military order of the Purple Heart has given his blood in the defense of his homeland shall ever be revered by his fellow countrymen. Wyoming Veterans Commission Firefighters for Veterans. So this is the... Uh, famous Purple Heart Monument here in Wyoming. Right next to the encased in stone, sad looking Lincoln Monument. Kind of weird. So interestingly, he's facing the setting sun. Reminds me of that Eagle song recently. Sinking in the sea.
Well, we don't have much time before night falls, but I thought we'd get a glimpse of these epic mountains up here on Snowy Range, Medicine Bow National Forest. So we can just hike over here real quick to the waterfall and take a gander. And we gotta find a campground quick before it gets dark. I don't wanna camp in the dark again. You know what I mean? It gets kinda old. Do we know what these mountains are called? Hmm? Do we know what they're called? No. Yeah. Just the snowy mountain range. <laughs> There's our little cabin for the night. Cozy. Yep, this is it, guys. Where we're staying. Oh. Cool if they had some like rentals like that. Right. Dude, that thing is built up years in advance. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool rock construction. Look how they did it. Squatters. Look at that cool blue rock right there. Yeah. It's yeah. probably where everybody pisses. <clears throat> there we go. Let's walk around the back. Don't want any pack rats in here. That's a cool little building though. I wonder what it was used for. Mm -hmm. Ranger Rick. <laughs> back in the day. Got a little age, early 40s maybe. Yeah. Little rocks though. <clears throat> Bet you'd stay warm if you had a little fireplace going. Yes. Toasty. <sighs> All right. Yeah, I remember the lake. So this is where we're staying tonight. Um, the outskirts of the Snowy Range um, in Medicine Bow National Forest here in Wyoming still. And I think we're at like the Willow, I think it's called, campground. Yeah, the way they designed these uh, national forests seems to be a pattern here in Wyoming. Uh, they don't allow for much freedom in my opinion let's just put it that way um, it's a highway it's a paved road and uh, there's not really any off-roads there's not really any off-roading in these national forests and so in typical form you know the government uh, just kind of channels the sheep where it wants us and uh, turns us into cash cows because the only place that you can actually camp in our national forest right are the uh, paid for campgrounds not that, you know, I'm up for that or anything, right? You know, usually can skirt by, just FYI, without dropping any money in their 
piggy banks. But, uh, yeah, so it's a little aggravating. Um, it's just like, okay, you can see your uh, land here, your uh, set aside for us all to enjoy recreational land. You can see it from the road as you're passing through, but you can't really, you know, get off the well-beaten cattle path and uh, do any exploring. It just kind of aggravates me a little bit, but it's a nice campground for now. It's a little chilly. It's uh, definitely fall. You know, September, late September, I think we're approaching now, aren't we? I've lost track. It's been that long, guys, since I've been on the road. But, yeah, so they'll probably be shutting these. There was actually two campgrounds that were perfectly fine, pretty nice-looking campgrounds. Uh, on the way down this road here, I guess we're on... Uh, the road we are on is 130. Highway 130, whatever. There's two other perfectly fine campgrounds that were closed, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're in the process of gradually shutting everything down. And, uh, okay, and just a little bit of spooky history since it's getting kind of dark out. I wasn't aware of this. Maybe you've heard this uh, story, but uh, those mountains that we just passed going up and over that divide, um, one of them was uh, Medicine Bow Mountain. And uh, according to this article, back in uh, 1955, there was a United Flight 401 crash that killed 66 people. Uh, and it crashed right into that mountain. So uh, real quick, this is how the story goes. John Vandell was a junior pharmacy major in the University of Wyoming when he and his Sigma Nu brothers received a phone call from the United Airlines. It was the morning of uh, October 7th, 1955. Flight 409 crashed into the east side of Medicine Bow Peak just 24 hours earlier. The guy that called us, this is a quote, the guy that called us had been in our fraternity years before, Vandal said. So he had called our fraternity and said, if you get some guys up there, we're going to pay you pretty well. So all the guys volunteered. People were needed to remove the bodies of the 66 people aboard the plane, and Vandal agreed. It was all curiosity, he said. We got to go up and see what it was all about. He didn't know the crash 40 miles west of Larimer, Wyoming, where the university is located, was at the time the worst air disaster in United States history. 63 passengers and three crew members sat in the DC-4 aircraft, a four-engine propeller airplane, as it left Denver Stapleton International Airport the morning of October 6, 1955, with plans to land in Salt Lake City less than three hours later. According to United Airlines documents, one of many documents about the crash stored in the archives of the University of America Heritage Center, among the 66 people aboard were members of the U.S. military, choir members from the Salt Lake City, uh, the Mormons uh, Tabernacle Choir, and two infants. The normal flight path goes far north of Laramie to skirt the Snowy Peak Range. However, a United Airlines investigation after the crash concluded pilots would occasionally fly over Medicine Bow Peak, the range's highest point, to save time. That's a hard lesson to learn, right? Not to take shortcuts sometimes in life. Windy weather as reported over the snowies the night before the crash, along with possible snowfall, you know, made it for less than ideal flying conditions, right? Obviously. We've experienced some of those crazy winds around here the weather that you can just sweep in out of nowhere. Reminds me a lot of Colorado, actually. When Flight 409 failed to report in at the Rock River, Wyoming, 40 miles north of Laramie, fighter jets from the Wyoming Air National Guard were scrambled with orders to find the missing aircraft. The plane crashed at 7.26 a.m., according to the onboard clocks recovered after the crash. The investigation report states, it exploded on impact, creating a debris field about a mile long. Two huge black marks scorched the side of the mountain. Wreckage and bodies were catapulted over the precipice. Wow. The plane impacted only 25 feet below the mountain crest. See, that's quite an explosion. No surviving that kind of crash, trust me. At that point, you have one last quick prayer to make if you're even aware of what's going on. The tail section broke off and lodged itself on a small outcropping halfway down the cliff. The rest of the wreckage tumbled down snowy rocks coming to a rest at the foot of the peak. 
Help arrives. The crash was discovered by an F-80 fighter jet based out of Cheyenne at 11.40 a.m. the day of the crash. The pilot spotted a huge black smudge where it hit the peak and pieces of wreckage that slid 200 feet down the side of the precipice. With bad weather still engulfing the crash site, the jets were ordered back to base before more surveillance could be completed. Bob Foster, a Civil Air Patrol member from Laramie, was the first person to reach the crash site. He recounted his experience during a 1996 interview for the American Heritage Center. Quote, As we walked along the tail slope of the mountain, we started to run into wreckage, landing gears, and main struts of the wing. And then you look to where we saw the plane crash, and you see these plane parts quartered a mile away. It's obviously going to be a really bad scene. You don't really expect to find any live people. Personnel began arriving soon after the crash was discovered. A group of 14 rescue workers from Denver operating base at United Airlines arrived by the plane at 2 p.m. Thursday. Timing of the disaster couldn't have been worse. More than 1,500 Shriners packed the hotels of Laramie at the time of the convention, leaving almost no place to house scores of airline personnel streaming into the area. In October 7, 1955, Bloomberg article states, and then it goes on, recovering the dead. Only the best mountaineers could reach the peak where a majority of the wreckage was scattered. Many of the trails and paths available today did not exist in 1955. Dr. John Bunch made the climb with airline officials, local law enforcement and reporters to the base of the cliffs above Mirror Lake to treat any potential survivors. The state of the bodies was such that they could only be identified by fingerprints. The explosion showered the area with wreckage workers had to avoid. There were large sections of twisted metal at the base of the cliff, so twisted in fact you couldn't tell what they were, Bunch said. There were pieces of the plane all over the base of the mountain. Body bags were brought in uh, to the crash site to transport the dead to the bottom of the cliff. A rope and a pulley system about 900 feet long was created, running from the top of the cliff to the base of the mountain. Vandal, the guy that was mentioned earlier, and his fraternity brothers arrived later that Friday after the system was set up. He worked the lower end of the pulley system. We got a call early that morning and we all skipped class and went up there, he said. And he says 30 people were helped to the area. The UW Summer Science Camp, a group of log cabins not far from the site, served as a temporary morgue. They did all their identifying in there and we weren't allowed in there, he said. In fact, nobody wanted to go in there. I can imagine, pretty gruesome. All the victims were in bags by the time Vandal and his fraternity brothers received them at the base of the mountain. Some bags labeled spare parts. The group avoided some of the traumatic sights others higher up the mountain had to see. We were all kind of having fun and joking around in between the trips, but it was serious business. 57 victims had been recovered from the mountain by the afternoon and the following Monday. A spokesperson at United Airlines stated October 10th, he estimated 125 people were still working at the site. Members of the Uni University of Wyoming and the University of Colorado Alpine teams were working in six-man shifts, searching for and lowering bodies. By Tuesday, all the victims had been recovered and identified. While the victims were all removed from the site, wreckage from the large four-engine airplane was still strewn about, from pistons and wing struts to landing gear and propellers. However, the entire tail section and the plane was still lodged precariously in the mountain face, hundreds of feet above the ground. It was decided the wreckage needed to be destroyed. To discourage curious climbers, the solution was to shoot the tail down with a recoilless rifle. A small artillery piece, John Sims said in 1996, interview with American Heritage Center. They didn't want to leave it there because there were so many people crawling around in there. You think that thing would come down? Oh no. It took hit after hit. Eventually the wreckage was dispersed but many pieces of the plane litter the mountain base to this day. And the U.S. Civil uh, Aeronautics Board announced the day after the crash a quote thorough and detailed investigation would be to determine the cause of the worst commercial airline disaster. Several theories formed about the cause of the crash, but none were confirmed. Three local loggers were working at a site about 10 miles southeast of the crash, and one told the board the right inboard motor on the DC-4 was not rotating, possibly indicating some sort of mechanical failure. United Airlines officials and wreckage showed the engine was working, even if the engine was out. Passengers would begin to feel ill effects at that altitude. 
through the investigation, uh, United Airlines managers in Denver and Salt Lake City said the pilot, Captain Clinton C. Cook Jr., and his first officer, Ralph D. Salzberg Jr., were good pilots with a perfect record. Cook had flown the route 45 times in the previous year. His Civil Aeronautics Board accident investigation report states and had never been known to uh, deviate the flight plan without telling a dispatcher. However, it's almost certain the pilots purposely went out of their way to fly over the mountains, the report states. The report goes on to state, deviating from the course, quote, would have been breaking rigid company rules, and his record indicated that he had never been known to do so. Carbon monoxide poisoning leading to crew incapacitation was also listed as a possible, albeit unlikely, cause. Today, hikers and climbers near Medicine Bow Peak can view pieces of the wreckage, although the black scars on the cliff face faded long ago. Vandale kept a piece of wreckage for many years, he said, and still occasionally thinks about the crash today. Quote, I kept on wondering over the years how the devil they did it, he said. Quote, how did he happen to just run into a mountain? So that's an interesting story I thought I'd share. It took a little while to get through it. There's a lot of interesting stories, lives that have come and gone out in these ancient mountain ranges. It's always something to learn from history, those that have come before us. Something that we can hopefully apply to our own lives, in some sense, gain from their experience. Alright, I'm cold. It's time to eat. Thanks for listening.